didn't think we had. Uh, I didn't think we had too many people today. So I'm really glad that you're all here. And a lot of people are out of town, and I'm, this is just the perfect number. So I'm really glad that you're here. And before we get started, uh, two things. Next week we have a, a really great uh, presenter. Rebecca Myers is going to do a presentation on Our Lady of Guadalupe. Ooh. So it's kind of she's got some interesting stories and uh, what do they call retabala? You know those little uh, tablets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, she's going to bring her collection of those. And oh. we've had her speak before, but she's really a, um, a fun lecturer. So okay. if, if you get a chance to come next Thursday at two o'clock. That would be good. And I ask you, um, what we're going to start out with is um, Roger's going to tell a little bit about about the book, how he wrote it, his inspiration, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, I'll kind of open up a discussion for you guys. But if you'd speak loudly, that would be great. You know, the acoustics aren't too good in this room, and we don't have a microphone or anything like that. So if you if you talk, if you want to talk, raise your hand a little bit. I'll call on you and. Just make be sure and talk loud. And I think that's all I need to say as far as housekeeping. Um, I would like to tell you for sure, though, that Roger has written some other books, too, that I'm sure you would enjoy as well. Um, that's the, la the latest one I haven't read yet. And he might tell you a little bit about that, too. But I've read Mr. Buckerfield and the Speed Up Life series. Those are young adult books, but not money. But they're really, really good. Um, I, I know that you'd enjoy those too. So we have them here at the library, and you can purchase them on Amazon. So anyway, um, okay. I think that's all I have to say. Roger Green, our guest author that we're very pleased to have, um, informs me that he moved to Levita 17 years ago, and. He built, he's built a house up on uh, Middle Creek by hand, <laughs> you know, with some assistance. And it took a long time to get it done, but he's been here for a long time. And I was trying to figure out how long I've known Roger, but probably that long, maybe 15 years, you know, from the store. And a little bit of Levita history, Roger worked for Don and I at Charlie's for a time, too. So we got to know him even better, and then through the Methodist Church, and you know, he's just been around, and we're just we when we do the two peaks one book uh, series, the criteria is a great work of work of fiction, and you know we've had some famous authors and all of that, but this year we thought that Roger's book is a great work of fiction, even though he's not famous yet. <laughs> it can certainly stand with other really great books. And so we're really just delighted that we happen to have an author of this caliber living right here in La Vida. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys all enjoyed the book. I did very much. And anyway, we're just delighted to have Roger. So tell us a little bit, Roger, how you all did right. this thing. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. I think I know most of you. There might be like two of you I don't know. So, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if, and if you can't hear me, please raise your hand, okay? <clears throat> talk, uh, talk loud. <laughs> no smart Alex, okay? <laughs> so, um, I was starting a fire in the wood stove one night, wrinkling up newspapers. Um, I had been up to Colorado Springs. I had some of my mother's recycling from the Colorado Springs Gazette newspaper. And there's a thing right inside the front page that says, 25 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So in 2016, I was starting a fire, and I saw um, a little blurb about uh, Joe Bruce and Lester Atkinson, who had made a bike ride from Colorado Springs to New York City. And I'm like, oh wow, this is, this is interesting. So I set it aside, and I went into work the next day, and started talking about it with the receptionist, and she found an article in a magazine from Galesburg, Illinois about the boys passing through. I'm like, you know, I might be able to get some pieces on this and, and make a story. So um, I worked for another, what, three years before I could retire. And then when I retired, 
um, I started looking in a newspaper archive. I went to the Carnegie Library in downtown Colorado Springs, looked at old yearbooks, looked at old uh, Gazette newspapers, just did everything I could to research it. I went to the cemetery, looked at the graves, and just started piecing the, the story together. So I made little notes so I don't forget. <coughs> so what I started with is a, a timeline because I needed to uh, work in a bigger story along with the boys just riding bicycles. So I started looking up what happened in 1916 on a United States level and a world level. And of course, that was the start of um, World War I over in Europe. The United States hadn't been part of that yet. Um, but we had some, I guess, warning shots, you would call them. We had the Preparedness Day bombing in San Francisco. We had the Black Tom Island explosion. Um, and we had uh, Henry Ford, who was a very large figure in that time, uh, who was very much against the United States getting involved in Europe's war. But then we had other people who were very, um, very much thinking we should be part of that. So anyway, um, we had prohibition about to come into effect. It had already come into effect in Colorado in January of 1916. We had um, women's suffrage trying to get the vote. We had several other things going on. We had the start of capitalism. That was only a couple years old. And slavery had not ended that long ago. You know, it had ended maybe 40, 45 years before. So we had a whole new population of people who were free and didn't have a place in society yet. So I just made a timeline. I knew where the boys were on certain dates. And then I knew the dates of certain historical things. So I just started to put together a story. So what I think was most important to me was making the boys real people and trying to feel the times, like immerse us in the time. So you guys will tell me in the discussion if I did that OK. <laughs> and I, when I write, I try to make it visual. So if I'm seeing something in my head, I really try to get that on paper so you can see it in your head. And um, I'd like to know how I did on that as well in the discussion. Um, I also gave the boys, well, I, getting to know the boys' family, families, kind of gave me an idea of who they would be. And so I just kind of like expanded their personalities and then gave them something each to work on too. You know, for Joe Bruce it was um, taking more chances, not being so prudent and cautious, and then for Lester it was just slow down a little bit, buddy. <laughs> so anyway, um, and I did try to incorporate some wisdom, because I feel if you're writing a book, or if you're reading a book, if you're, you're taking the time to read a book, you should get something out of it. So. Um, I tried to put in, you know, some wisdom, and hopefully that resonated with people. We'll find out. Um, it took about a year and a half of actual writing, and then I gave a few copies to, to trusted advisors and friends, and they gave certain parts thumbs up and certain parts <laughs> thumbs down, and they pointed out a lot of misspellings and misused words. Um, and Sarah might elaborate on that a little <laughs> later. <laughs> um, and then I thought, okay, I'm ready. You know, I'm, I'm ready to get this thing published. But I wanted to enter it into some contests. So I started reading, you know, what to really be careful of in these contests. And one of them said, watch how much you use the word the. And I'm like, well, I don't think I overused the word the. <laughs> so the, I did a word count the, and it ended up I used it almost one out of ten words was a the. <laughs> so, Interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, it took me 
two months of four to six hour days of redoing sentences and paragraphs <laughs> to try to get rid of the's. Do you think they were improved? Huh? Do you think it was improved? I got it down to one in 26. Wow. No, but do you think the writing was improved? Right? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're dealing with a time that you're not familiar with, it's real easy to use the. Because I did a word count on other books, and I used it like 2,000 times in a book. You know, which isn't, which isn't bad for a 70,000-word book. But in this one, I have really just gotten lazy and not paid attention. So that was two months of really, really unpleasant work. <laughs> so what I came up with is what you've read, and that's what our discussion will be about. And so you didn't have an editor or anything like that. You were the editor, right? Well, and, and people that read it. And, and, and just your, your friends or whatever, right? So, yeah. 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 Right. And I, I do want to say before I forget, um, please do review the book on Amazon for me when you get a chance, because that makes a really big difference in uh, other people buying it or taking a chance on reading it. So I would appreciate that. Yeah, that's that. true. Yeah, I need to do that as well. So, well, um, so somebody was supposed to be here today to lead this discussion, and they're not here. So you have me to do this. <laughs> and I haven't done this in a long, long time. So, you know, you just have to bear with me. Um, and I want, I don't want to just listen to the talk. I want you to tell me, I want you guys to all talk for sure. But I just want to start it out with, I think that Roger did a really great job on the characters. I mean, I don't think you can read the book and not feel like you, you know that Lester was a likable guy with an infectious smile and enthusiasm for life. You could see him waving to people, you know, as he's doing his deliveries, and uh, you know, I, I just think his character really came to life, and then his motivation for wanting to, um, to make this great journey, you know, of his brother dying and his brother wanting to do this, and that's what that was the impetus for him to want to do it, and then Joe, Joe Mueller Bruce Pike, and so he was characterized as hard-working, sorrowful-looking, playing with big ears, <laughs> you know? And so you could kind of see him as a, a scrappy kid, but very intelligent. And uh, I, love this, I love this quote that, that he said about himself. One way to make me succeed was to mention the um, unlikeliness of my success. <laughs> so I really like that. <laughs> so what did, you guys, what did you guys think about the characters? Did you like Did you like Joe and what, what are your take on the characters? They were very real because of the way you describe them. And, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were real people. Mm -hmm. They were real young men. I was astounded at how well, there was a four year age difference mm -hmm. and that kind of, to me, I wondered now how many 20 year olds would take a 16 year old or what, along on a trip across the country. But they. Well, you know, they kind of needed each other they, for yeah, various they reasons. Well you know, together, yeah. And stuff. Yeah. I know it struck me as that, well, I thought about my own sons. I thought about my own son. I don't think my son at 15 or any time would have been able to ride his bike or would I have let him. Right as back to New York City, yeah. you know what I mean? So the fact that the dad even yeah. left, uh, if you didn't know that this was historic fiction, you might think, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, that would never happen. How could that ever happen? But to know that it's a true story just mm -hmm. really made it special to me. Yeah. And I love, and uh, uh, is this all your invention, uh, Roger? Where, where Joe makes the meat. I mean, he's not going to be, you know, I mean, I love that whole scene of, I'm not here following you, either we ride together or, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, was that your total fabrication or, I mean, assessment of what it would be like, but I loved that the younger guy was saying, hey, you know, well, we're equals here. 
you know, I think it's a combination of imagination and life experience. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're hardly ever on the same page with someone you're going to do something with. So you have to you have to get those positions. Like the rules, yeah. yeah. Did the you, laws of physics, right? <laughs> did you have a picture of them, Roger? Did, I did. Really to, um, it, it, I mean, Roger really didn't have much to go by of information about these guys, other than their, you know, obituary later on. Okay, the look at the ears, and that's Joe Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Okay, in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Is Lester in that shot? Um, you no. know, I, no. I could not find any pictures of Lester, his brothers, anything. No. Um, whoops. <coughs> Urban Bruce is there at the bottom. Uh -huh. um, he is the family despot for, uh, for Joe, the guy that's always kind of criticizing him. And up in the uh, left corner, you can see why I described Joe as um, his legs were mostly knobby knees. <laughs> and this was probably a year after the ride. And there's, there's Joe again. Is this a basketball uniform they have on? Yeah, he was actually the captain of the basketball team for four years, and then he quit basketball and was the captain of the football team for his senior year. And that is, Joe is center on that photo. He was also in what they called the Senate at Colorado Springs High School. They each uh, would represent a state and kind of meet uh, to understand the way government worked. That type of thing. That is Joe holding the trophy for the 1918 Colorado Basketball Champions. That's in his uh, Colorado Springs High School letter sweater. They didn't have letter jackets, I guess. This uh, highlighted at the bottom is the notice that they had found Guy Atkinson's body um, up in Canada. This is the brother that died that sent the, uh, was the impetus for these, these boys taking the trip. That monstrosity was Colorado Springs High School. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was brand new. I think in 1915. Somebody wanted to know the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't be like <laughs> It's the same location it's as where all my high school. Yeah, because that looks like the death of blind school architecture also, which may have been built about that same time. It had already, death and blind school had already been built. built. Right, but probably the same yeah. general styles. Yeah, you'll. In, uh, when they're making their first ride, they pass the high school just as the monstrous clock tower strikes eight, and they take it as a starting bell. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. That is Lester's draft card. Did he have to? Did he go into the service? Do you know, Roger? He went in. Um, he did go into the tail end of World War I as a mechanic for the Army. Okay. Um, and that's his signature down on the bottom. You can kind of tell a lot from people's signatures, too. Um, and then Joe's, whoops. That's Joe's uh, signature on the bottom of his um, draft card. So that's that's all I have for photos. Did Joe also serve? I'm sorry. Did Joe also serve? No, he wasn't old enough yet. You had to be 21 
1916 to join. And he was, he was not that old. Okay, I think that'll turn off on the time. That was a longer interruption than you thought, right? No, no, that's okay. I was glad to, I'm glad to have a few pictures that, I guess, you know, because Lester was older and, I don't know, he was already out of high school or it's just hard to find anything of his. He, he never graduated. None of his brothers graduated. Um, I, and they had a weird school schedule back then. You could graduate at Christmas time. You could graduate in the spring. And oh, okay. your, it wasn't four consecutive years. It was kind of like however long you wanted to go, <laughs> when you wanted to go. I'm not sure. Oh, really? Huh. Because they were in high school for sometimes five, six years. Oh, hmm. I don't know. I don't oh, understand how it worked. Well, that's pretty impressive that he, you know, he wasn't very physically big, but to be, once he got back from his trip, then he went back to high school and was on the basketball team and the football team and at a big high school like that. So, Roger's from Colorado Springs, so I, you guys know so he's from Colorado Springs. Um, but anyway, I thought that, well, I loved a lot of the characters in the book, but I thought the boys, you know, we really had a picture of those guys. Jenny? I just have a question about um, the Carnegie uh, Library. Was, is that the Penrose Library, or was that its old name, or is it a different library? Well, the downtown Penrose Library is actually built in front of the Carnegie Library, which still stands. Oh, okay. You, you'll see it if you go on. Is it Bijou or Kiowa? Kiowa. Kiowa, you see the Carnegie Library. And you go through the new library to get to the Carnegie Library. To the old one. The old one might have that round building in it. It does, yes. Okay. The reading room. Is there any historical uh, effect to their trip, their routing? Uh, or did you just conjure that yourself? Um, <clears throat> there was, when they arrived in New York City, there was an article in the Colorado Springs Gazette that they had traveled 2,699 miles via the Great Lakes. And so you you chose the places then that, that are in the book? Well, are you trying to? Lester was born in Detroit, okay. so I think that they had family there. So they stopped in Detroit, <laughs> and then his maternal, Lester's maternal kin, his mom and his aunt, who became his mother, um, both came from Toronto. So I figured they stopped in Detroit, they probably also stopped in Toronto, then they went on to New York City. And then I never went to the return trip in the story, but all of Joe's kin was in Missouri, so I, I think they stopped there on the way back. And then both boys married girls born in Missouri, so I think they met their future wives in Missouri. Oh, that's another yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <I'm laughs> so was there any other information about their return trip? Um, I know they got back on September 30th. They had planned to come back on September 5th before the start of school. But some something happened, I don't know what, that they were delayed. They met those girls. They met those girls. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I'd like you to comment on how you conjured up all the characters that, he had, that they encountered on their trip. I think these characters are what give the story so much depth and make the boys grow as persons and learn about how there's so many different kinds of people in the world from where they had come from. I think that's one of the main parts of the book, really. And I kept a list of all the encounters as, it, as they yeah. happened through the book. Yeah, I thought it was a great uh, mechanism or whatever to have each chapter be yeah. about a character kind of, that, or an experience, or a place, or, you know, something like that. It, first of all, it made it very easy to read, you know, broken up that way, but easy to read, easy to remember, and uh, I just thought that was a good way to introduce kind of like stepping stones in their <coughs> development of they met this person, they've never met, they 
when they were in, um, when they met the, the black family, yeah, yeah Queenie and uh, her daughter, and they, you know, of course they had encountered uh, black people, but they never had dinner with them and realized the the great family that they had and the, the joy that they had and the, how they were appreciating their newly won freedom, basically. Mm -hmm. And so there were some great, some great lines in there, you know, in that in that chapter about that about that encounter. And then the well, then as I don't know how many of you guys went to the the presentation that the professor did here, mm -hmm. uh, which was really good too. But he mentioned in this book um, a, a, an interesting part of when they met the Native American man uh, that was in full regalia, you know, there and mm -hmm. but who was well-educated, um, Shakespeare and Thoreau and all of that stuff, and a Presbyterian. But he, but he looked, when they first encountered him, he looked quite frightening, you know, because of the way he was dressed and stuff. But he said that he had to be like that, uh, he chose to be like that, or that people would, he would be better received to be like that than if he was dressed in a, you know, a suit and a tie. And uh, so that, even the professor noted that. That that was an interesting thing. Right from the very beginning, that young, very little young guy, you know, who I, I thought that you know that he's You're sitting too. there and saying in, in uh, Denver, yeah, and uh, you know that this kid was making it happen. I mean, I, I it, it was a wonderful character, and there. Uh, Little Jack all trade, no every back row and every every uh, everything. I mean, he was just a, um, and then and then the wisdom about you know. This small amount of money means so much to this little boy. Um, he's 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 not eating a lot. Um, so that, I thought I that, thought that was a great. I like that piece too. Yeah. That was a good character. Yeah. Lynn, I, I didn't answer your question. Um, the characters come from all the voices in my head. Figments of your imagination. Great uh, imagination. You know, there, there were certain things I wanted to capture in characters. Um, the sovereign man, the Dr. Love with his um, alcohol moonshine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, because there was a lot of that. Um, the street urchin in Denver. Um, of course, the black family. And one of you had said something about the black family that really moved you. I have a, I, I have. <laughs> to me, that's the most poignant part of this yeah. whole book for me. Me too. It was right before, it's right at the end of 17. Can I just read yeah. it? Oh, yes. I love this. Um, Lester said, Queenie explained to me that they danced every night, not because they had the energy, but because they were free. And he says, um, Joe says, how come white folks don't dance like that? And he said, we dance every day, Pike. I look over at Lester's half smile, and the riddle began. You and I dance every day. We go where we want. We do what we want. We go to Robin's on the corner for ice cream. We sit in front of the trolley. Our fathers are tradesmen and businessmen. Your brother is a detective. Your sister is a nurse. Our income is measured in dollars, not in pennies, but sharpening knives or cleaning homes or cooking or taking care of other people's children. I'm welcome wherever I go. I can shake the hand of everyone I meet. We dance every day, Pike. We just haven't noticed the fiddle. I love that. I, yeah, that, was I that, that, that was my very favorite part. And in that same chapter on page 136, when Queenie comes out to tell them goodbye, and they're saying, we appreciate it, and then Queenie broke all the rules she'd not yet broken, she stepped forward, hands outstretched to grasp Lester's. Black hands took white. God bless you on your way. Mm -hmm. And that was such a visual picture for me, not yeah. just yeah. black hands and white hands. Yeah. Male and female, shriveled old hands, young, strong hands. Yes. Um, that just knocked me over. Yeah. I thought that was yeah. a very moving yeah. chapter. That one sentence, yeah. and then what Peggy just read. Mm -hmm. Those two things were the, the highlight of the book. For I me. think I'm going to put that on the mirror. I just haven't noticed the fit at all. It's important, I think. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah, that was 
I don't know. I think that was one of the things that I that I really liked about the book was you kind of got, in addition to the great characters that you kind of got to know, you kind of got some life lessons in there. And I know you said that's what you wanted to do, but I mean, the wisdom <laughs> that these boys had. I'm not so, so sure what June Bug's life lesson <laughs> was. But okay, June Bug. <laughs> But, but um, Lester said to, to Joe, this is how freedom is won, Joe. You don't wait for it to be bestowed. You take it and you don't give it back, you know, about freedom. And so the book was about, about freedom and about coming of age and about just so many themes. You know, for when we were trying to do, when we decided to do the book, uh, we usually have a theme. But I couldn't come up with the real theme of this book because there were, just a multitude of themes that that were applicable to this. So it wasn't any one it wasn't any one theme. One theme I think throughout this book is um, um, there's good in everybody because they met some real dicey characters <laughs> along the way. <laughs> they never had any trouble. They never got robbed, beaten up, or, or whatever. Yeah. The gypsies there were questionable. Were, yeah. 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 There were good people. Yeah. All the different kinds of people. They were all good people. Mm -hmm. And part of it was well, because these boys were good. Right. They would never have thought of saying or doing anything to the black family or whoever. Uh -huh. They were good boys. And it, you know, it's returned to you. Right. You know? Yeah, you're right. I mean, they had a lot of adventures with flies and mud <laughs> yeah. and all of that stuff, but not But they never anybody. ran into any... <clears throat> and people were helpful. Questionable to them. People. Yeah, people helped them. Yeah. 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 And going back to the character of the, uh, of the two boys, it was so interesting to me see, to see how different they were in the beginning and how they helped one another grow. How Joe changed in the four, was it four years that they had, had this planned or two years before they left? Two. Two, years. two. In those two years, Joe started changing and he started mm -hmm. looking at himself and his holding back, his withholding and his, his hesitancy to come on board. Do you know what I mean? And I think this created a big change in Joe. And Lester, too. I mean, I think the death of Lester's brother really affected him. But I think they, they were the two kinds of friends who were quite different, but they learned from one another. And that's, those are great friendships. And we all have them. You know, maybe they're the basis of all our friendships. But I thought it was so apparent in this book. How did you develop the characters like that? Was that something in, uh, that you experienced yourself somewhere? Um, or was um, that purely the way you felt that they traveled or they developed into the travelers? Well, I, um, you can learn a lot from their siblings, um, how, how they were from their siblings. So, um, Guy Atkinson, the one that drowned in Canada in 1914, he had been in the newspaper for running away from home in 1912. Mm -hmm. um, he had decided he needed to look for work, so he made it as far as Salida in March, and then he contacted his dad to come get him. <laughs> um, but it, you know, they put everything in the newspaper back then, so um, the headline was. Um, Guy Atkinson runs away from home, which has got to be an embarrassment to the family, right? And then, um, so I knew a little bit about his character from that. And then um, Lester got fined a dollar in 1914, I think, for riding his bicycle on the sidewalk in downtown Colorado Springs. So I figured, well, between those two things for those brothers, they were Hellions. <laughs> so that's why the first chapter is the Hellion. Um, and then Joe, his older brother Irvin, turned out to be a detective for the Colorado Springs Police. He wrote for the newspapers, he wrote sports features for the newspaper. Um, 
So very responsible. Their dad was a real estate broker and an insurance salesman. Uh, his sister Nellie became a nurse. So I've been thinking this is a very responsible, very community-oriented family. So they're kind of cautious and prudent. So that's how I came up with what I thought Joseph So you had about. some historic background to yeah. developing their, their personalities. Right. And Joe did go on to college. He went on to Colorado College and uh, became a marketing person. He worked for the Denver Post up until 1969. Thank you. I did a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger, in your research, were you able to connect with any of the descendants of Joe or Lester? Um, as or did you try to do that? That's my son, by the way, one with the camera. Yes. Um, oh, okay. That's Brooke. Um, I was telling him at lunch that it's interesting that neither boy had biological children after riding bicycles for 4,000 <laughs> <laughs> and, and that very likely something got injured <laughs> on a monkey road. So they never had any biological children. Lester married a war widow, I believe adopted her three children, uh, but a, a dead end for all three children. So, no no ability to find a, I would love to have found a journal from a family member, but no family members. Well, you really didn't need it. I mean, to, you really... And if one showed up now, I would throw it away because <laughs> I'm not yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. No revisions. <laughs> you know, Joe said that um, did the day they buried God, that his childhood died that day. Mm -hmm. You know, and it and it kind of did change, kind of did change both of them that that day of uh, putting somebody in the ground, somebody young like that. And of course, that's what prompted Lester to come up with this um, idea that he wanted to do this. But yeah, and so um, like every child who died that day. I realized that life was something to be seized and cherished, that I own, owned nothing but the moment, that lie in my hand and the single breath in my lungs, mm -hmm. and not one thing more. So, I like that. And then, then this quote, this one I really love, this Theodore Roosevelt. Peggy and I didn't have a very good history education at the end of high school. Love them. <laughs> I love Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> but I think I must have slept through some of the history classes or something. But anyway, I like Theodore Roosevelt too, and the quotes from him were really great. But courage, courage is not having the strength to go on. It's going on when you don't have the strength. Mm -hmm. And so, isn't that great? I think that's good for anybody that survives something or is trying to survive something. But, but the quotes were really Right. I really enjoy those. I missed it the first time around. I have to say that I, I was like, well, Roger's really working his chops here on, I mean, this explosion in the harbor and, you know, the statue getting, and, I'm like, and then it's like, oh my God, this, I never, I I've never, never heard of it. Ever, I had neither. Ever heard of that. No, I mean, I that, that the explosion was so big. Yeah. Uh, I mean, who they thought of, and that the statue, yeah. really, I was, I I was know damaged. I mean, it was like, wow, so how did you find out all about that? Those historic things. Mm -hmm. Reading the newspaper articles. So you were just looking at what happened in 26, or 1916? Right, and the statue didn't get fixed until 1984. Is oh, that right, mm -hmm. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. For a really long time. Huh. And but they did mention when the boys went, there was a part of, the, her, of her crown that was still wow. broken off. It took until 84 to... Well, until they fixed the arm and the torch. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and, wow. Terry, if you wouldn't mind elaborating a little bit, she asked me when I had been to the Statue of Liberty, and I said, well, I planned to go, you know, while I was researching this book, but COVID came, mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, I'm just going to make everything up. So, <laughs> Terry, if you don't and mind. And what I told Roger, um, I said, you nailed it, because the, the feeling reading his um, description of it and how the boys felt and talking to the people, 
how important that statue is. When you roll up, I mean, because you, you see it, I'm from Jersey, you know, we wave. But well, when you go to see it, and, and you see how important people would, when they would come into the harbor and see her, and mm -hmm. I'm, I've made it from, you know, who knows where, and traveling just horrendous conditions. And, you know, these kids biked on not fancy bikes like mm -hmm. we have now, mm -hmm. two wheels and a couple of pedals. Through this mud, because I told Roger, that, <laughs> mud, 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 like the mud is <laughs> really <laughs> <the> optimal. <laughs> and that they get to the Statue of Liberty through this mud, and it just really captured what the Statue of Liberty is all about. You know, uh, that part of the book meant so much to me because my grandpa Tony, uh, he, he was born in Italy, and uh, his mother died in childbirth as he was being born. And his dad was so distraught that he left, he, he left Tony with his relatives and just moved, uh, immigrated to the United States. And he said he'd send for Tony when he got settled. And so when Tony was seven years old, his aunt and uncle, whatever, put him on a, the boat and he came over to the United States with no other relatives. By himself? Uh, okay. Yes, the, the, just the, you know, the other people on yeah. the boat, but he came over by himself. So when Brother Tony was 100 years old, he came out to New Jersey mm -hmm. to see us. So we took him to Ellis Island, and any old of you people, I guess there's hardly anybody mm -hmm. except that you can remember that my grandpa lived to be 104, mm -hmm. almost, mm -hmm. with a phenomenal memory, a phenomenal memory. So we took him to Ellis Island, and he's like, he remembered the name of the boat. So we looked up in the log books, and there it said Anthony Massenton. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it Mass Antonio? It was, it was, yes, it was. Yeah, Mass M-A-C-H-I-A-N-T-O-N-I-O, -N -N Mass Antonio. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he, he told us what it was like when he saw the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. That it was really, mm -hmm. but he was so, you know, he was so excited. To when see he was that seven. Meant to him. He was when seven he, years old. Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. he did, but he seeing it coming in, you know, coming yeah. in and yeah. seeing that statue yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So and what that, year was his that? His dad met him there. What year would, would he have been coming in? Jeez. Uh, I don't even. I don't even know. <laughs> I can't even really do the math to think about that. Oh, so never mind. What year did he die? He was, he was uh, What year did he die? I don't know. I don't even know what year he was born. No, no. I'll, I'll try to concentrate on that for a minute. What year did he die? But anyway, when he came to see us in New Jersey, oh, okay. he was 100 years old. He was 100 years old, and he's still. And you all were able to go that day. Yeah. Yes. And it was, it was a beautiful, wonderful day. And. Uh, I have a great, have a great picture. I'll have to bring it to the library for you to show. Also, when he was in New Jersey, we, we took some pictures out on um, across of my dad and grandpa are in the foreground, and then the the trade towers are behind them. We didn't know that in a few years we'd lose my grandpa, and we'd lose, we'd also lose my dad and the World Trade Center too. But anyway, that chapter really meant a lot to me about, and they talked about how Lester's dad, too, was an immigrant kept coming to this country. I have a confession to make. <laughs> 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 you that up. Watch what you so, say, Roger. So Roger made a mistake. Um, what? Yes, Roger made a mistake. It's on, it's on the website, my retraction. So it wasn't Lester's dad. No, it wasn't Joe's dad that came through the eyes. It was Lester's dad. It was dad. Lester's dad. But in the book, the first version of the book, I said it was Joe's dad. Okay. So I thought it was Lester's dad. It, it is. It is Lester's dad. Oh, but, <laughs> but I had, you know, you, I had all these things in my head, and by the time I wrote the book, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember this. So, <laughs> and I didn't fact check it. Um, mm. So, anyway. But it was fixed after the first few copies. What well, is there? Is there a particular chapter or person that you admired the most, or that was the most? Um, I love the urchin, the Denver urchin. I love the urchin. Mm -hmm. um, I love Vidal. Vidal. Yeah, um, and I think Queenie. 
you know, Junebug was a lot of fun. Uh, it was June like, bug. how can I make her worse? Oh, yeah, I can do this. I <laughs> eat the whole cake without trying to How can she be more deplorable? Oh. But I think uh, the urchin and Videl are my favorite. Yeah. I like Videl a lot too. I hope he survived, you know. Yeah. Which I doubt. But. Can I ask a question about Jim Sure. <laughs> You're not going to like the answer. I should just tell you the answer. <laughs> okay, just tell me the answer. Because the question about June Bug is hard to phrase. Just tell me the answer. <laughs> June Bug is actually a metaphor for capitalism run <coughs> awry. Whoa, what? So if you look at everything about June Bug, her father was a banker. She was the apple of his eye. But she became greedy, and her beautiful figure in that massive painting mm -hmm. became this bloated, horrible um, caricature. Uh -huh. That's interesting, Roger. So she's she's a hundred percent metaphor. Uh -huh. That's wow. right. That answers the question entirely. I knew that was your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of metaphor in there, right? There's but a I didn't lot, get that one. A lot but of metaphor. As an English teacher, I'm sure Jenny got a lot of the metaphor. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> the metaphors. Shall I talk about this question I had about the end of the book, or should I wait? No, so, you can. You can. So you can okay. jump around. Well, at matter. the end of the book with the Statue of Liberty, I got hung up on the metaphor of the Statue of Liberty, and I got hung up about some conversation was that was going on in there about between the two boys. Oh, they were talking to the woman. Mm -hmm. I forget her name. The sojourner. Yes, the sojourner. And they and she said that liberty was justice. No, the, the lady was justice. The lady was justice. The whole statue was liberty. But between the torch, the tablet, the broken chains, who was the lady? The lady was justice, yes. and she completed the entirety of liberty. Okay. So I got hung up on this metaphor. Okay. It really, I mean, I got the third girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you got what? Berserk. <laughs> I kept thinking justice. I kept getting them mixed up because liberty and justice are so different. And in order to have, you have to have liberty to have justice. Or somehow, I got so hung up on this part that I drove myself crazy. <laughs> and I didn't understand it. And then it sounded like an omniscient author to me coming in and talking about it instead of the characters or something. So I have a hard time with that part. Right. Yeah, and we talked about that. That's yeah. it's okay. And I think, you know, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's how it affects it's you. It's thought provoking. Yeah. And ultimately, it's for the reader. It isn't for me. Yeah, it's exactly. It's for whatever you get out of it. Right. But when you read those words at the Statue of Liberty, you know, give me your poor, you know, all of that. It's really, you, you guys have been to the Statue of Liberty, yeah. a lot of you? It's really a moving thing, especially there being there with Grandpa. But mm -hmm. um, it really, yeah, it's really a very special thing that I'll always remember that mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. I've never that day. been to the statue, but I have sailed by her three times. Mm -hmm. Going across the Atlantic, coming back home, uh -huh. and then going across the Atlantic one more time. And, yeah, it does something to you. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. You yeah. have to be up there on deck. You got. You can't miss it. Of course, you must be standing up there on deck. Of course, she wasn't supposed to be green. That wasn't the real deal <laughs> <laughs> plan. Yeah. yeah. But, My parents uh, were immigrants. They did not come through. They came through New York, but they didn't come through Ellis Island. But still, that really. Was that true? A lot to me to see was that, that true, Roger, that the statue was supposed to be someplace else? And that's, a, that's a real deal, right? Yeah. yeah. It, was it was supposed to be at the uh, start of the Suez Suez Canal. Suez Canal. Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't uh, pay for the base. And the way the United States paid for the base to put the statue on the pedestal, I should say, mm -hmm. um, is uh, Mr. Pulitzer said he would publish everyone's name who gave even a penny to the, um, 
the uh, creation of the pedestal. So people wanted to see their name in the newspaper, they would make a contribution, their name would be published in the, was it the New York Times? Was it the New York Times? I think so. Did okay. anyone know if Pulitzer was New York Times? Uh, no, but probably. In that case, it was the New York Times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was given to the United States after the Civil War by the French for, for some reason. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Like it was a, you know, it, an appreciation for something we did. Yeah. That story is actually not true. No. Um, the artist, okay, I'm a little vague on that. The artist, I think, did get France to pay for the statue. Sorry, I'm, I'm too vague on it to, to comment. So I'm, I'm not going to... That's our homework for tonight. Right? That's, our, that's not our homework at all. <laughs> well, I, I, I was, when I was a kid, I, I'm amazed that the technology was available to create something like that. Mm. You know, the scale that people made things on back then without mm -hmm. the machinery we have today is just mind-boggling. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you go in the old mines in Colorado and you see these monstrous things that they used and made and somehow transported. I don't know how they did it. Well, the buildings in the United States that are historic are the same thing. Mm -hmm. They were built by hand, mm -hmm. by tradesmen, by hand, mm -hmm. without machinery. Manual hoist and so forth, all of that. And there's some massive buildings yeah. of that type. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, look at the pyramids. Mm -hmm. We just shake our heads. How on earth did they ever do it? I remember um, when I was, like I said, as a kid, but I remember there was something wrong with it, something broken. And that must have been from an explosion. But I'm pretty sure the explanation was something different than that. Uh, I, you know, you would know, none of us would know. But uh, anyway, when I read it in the book, it was interesting and totally, you know, new information to me. But that actually got damaged. Yeah, I didn't know anything at all about 1916 before I decided to write this story. <laughs> so don't don't feel bad. I, I'm like, wow. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting year, huh? It was, and the <laughs> professor, when he came, he really, yeah. he fact-checked everything. He um, but he was really impressed with your book, Roger. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, of your accuracy and all of that stuff. So it was kind of really great to have him, you know, kind of um, validate what you'd written. And yeah. stuff. I'm sure you enjoyed that. Cherie texted me later, and she <laughs> said, uh, what did you think of the professor? I said, he made me look smart. I love him. <laughs> you know, um, on page 170, I underlined like so many things in here. Yeah, she just really destroyed that book. I did destroy it. I really did. I just couldn't help it. But um, I liked this. They were in church, right? They were in church. And then he saw all of these images of all the things that he'd seen so far, and, and you know, just um, images flashed through my mind. Cubist nightmares, like those of Picasso and Dali. I saw sharks swimming in fresh water, traders blowing up their fellow countrymen in parades, lifeboats rowing away from this Lusitania sinking hulk, laughing swimmers diving off of boys, screen, grainy black and white photographs of dirigibles racing destruction, raging destruction in London a bowl of ice cream being set before me at Robin's on the corner, rolls of barbed wire laid across heavened battlefields, fords rolling off the assembly line, trenches filled with soldiers' twisted bodies, broken trees silhouetted against a sky of orange, blood red, a young cowboy walking, saddle on his shoulder, guy's casket being lowered into the grave, we feels undulating under the winds that herald a stream, a storm, clouds, dark and foreboding on the next horizon. And so that's, you know, that kind of just sums up all the things that they've seen and mm -hmm. the things that were going on in the world at that time. And what a lot. <laughs> you know, what a lot of stuff that they, that they saw and learned about, you know, and well, how could they ever go back to the end of the They've been on the road three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like that was their experience over several years. It was over no, this is just, weeks. yeah. So I, I thought that was 
just kind of a great summation of what, you know, what they had seen so far. And then they had a little bit more to go after that. Um, Mitzi, I, when I was reading this, a couple of things really jumped out at me because of a couple of books I had read shortly before I read this. One of them I read a couple of years ago. It's a, what's his name, Eric Larson. Um, it's called Dead Wake. And it's the story of the last voyage of Lusitania. So when you mentioned that, but, oh, wow. You know, I've read that book. I'm, I'm, yeah, I know what happened there. And then I had just finished reading The Lincoln Highway. Yeah. I was oh, really? Yeah. And, oh, yes. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my goodness, here's another Lincoln Highway trip. Yeah, I haven't so, read that yet. I do want to read If y'all haven't read those two, read them. Mm -hmm. What is the other one that you said? Dead Wake. Dead Wake. Yes. Is his, his name Eric? Is it an Eric Larson? He wrote, he wrote mm -hmm. Devil in the White City. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I can't remember the other one. Was, he he right? was it true about, about the Lincoln Highway that it was coming along for a while and then it just stopped? <laughs> and then it's a bunch well, of dirt. Yeah. Dirt goes and then it goes on again. They couldn't afford to pay at all. Well, yeah. Henry Ford um, thought the government should build the roads. The government thought people that manufacture cars should build the roads. <laughs> <laughs> so huh. Ford, Firestone, and Goodrich, I think, mm -hmm. all got together and said, we're going to pave a mile on this side of the city, this side of the city. Let the people know what this mile, how good that would be. Okay. And then they can vote taxes to make their roads. That was so that was the seedling mile. That was yeah. Having grown up in the boonies, where they were going on section lines, I have a real picture of that where you go a mile north, a mile east, a mile north, a mile east. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. And they did that a lot in both Colorado and Nebraska. And New Mexico. Well, they didn't go through New Mexico. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that there. in New Mexico yeah. on the railroads, and they're still there. Mm -hmm. They aren't changed. It's just as yeah. you described. Things are called seven mile road, eight mile road, nine mile road. Uh, that's one. Mm -hmm. That's all. Of that's as far as they would go paid. No, they were paid. They were gravel roads, and you oh. think of them before they were even maintained gravel roads. And it would be a cart path, maybe, mm -hmm. or one rut horse trail, or something. Yes. It wasn't a wasn't a road as we know yeah. roads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the section corners were used as direction or mileage marks. Right at the nine I mile mean, corner. That had nothing to do in a lot of people's minds with the actual property. It was the way the roads were built and the way you determined how far you went today. Um, read to Jessica? Yeah, I, a comment and a question. comment is, it, it just strikes me that the uh, this kind of thing would work really well for a movie. And so if you they, could just tell that to somebody in the world. So, you know, Spielberg. Movie, if nobody wrote the book for you. you. If you want to get it to be, you might have to do your own work to get someone to, to see the script. But this like, is the oh, question. Why isn't she here today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the question yeah, part is uh, it looks like it was a setup for a sequel, uh, the trip back. Yeah. Um, really, that's all it. I mean, that's the way it is in everything. Like, you hear somebody singing at the mercantile or at the school graduation or something that's better than anybody you ever hear on the radio, you know what I mean? It's just a matter of being at the right place mm -hmm. at the right time. Um, I, since I know nothing about cars, really, I don't even pay attention to what people drive, you know a lot about cars and those old cars and all of that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I was interested in all of that, that just, you know, they just have that information about all of those weird different types of cars out on the road at that time. And then there were people that were still didn't have a car, they had, you know, a horse or something like that. But such an interesting time. What were there were there bikes and this might have been explained. Did they have any gears on them? No gears at all. And they were really heavy. Um, I can't. 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 I
Yeah. 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 Kind of, right? yeah. But I mean, really, that's a feat to do that. And this room's on this feet. Right, right. Still didn't help with kids. No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, you asked me favorite characters. I forgot the vagabonds. Yeah. The two women. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Those are also oh, yeah. favorite characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, the real live wires. One of the really tragic uh, people was No Fingers Fred, right? Oh, yeah, No yeah. Fingers Fred. Oh, yeah. Yeah. that was so oh. sad that he had, you know, that was just really sad and true that true. that happened to people. And then, at the end when you're reading that, you know, I pictured him to be like an old guy. And he was 26 years old. Yeah. And then he was, you know, like, yeah. forever. He could only work at this low level job because of he's, he lost all of his. Abilities, you know, and, and that, I thought that I thought he was one of the really sad, you know, tragic figures of that. I might be wrong, but my memory brings me uh, to think that the geared bicycles happened after the Second World War. Oh, really? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I think so. I don't remember ever knowing of a geared bicycle before the four, late forties. People didn't travel that far on bicycles. They traveled around cities and so forth, and maybe from one farm to the next or whatever. Geared bicycles became popular when people wanted to go to Estes Park, or down to New Mexico, or up to Denver, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I thought uh, the discussion a couple of Sundays ago about just what the bicycle meant, you know, as a social phenomenon. I mean, particularly for women, uh, you know, that it was the first time they could really be, A, without an escort, go where they wanted, and uh, um, and then started wearing clothes. Anyway, I just thought the whole thing that must have been happening right about that time, that bicycles were big. Well, and they were cheap. They didn't cost a lot. They were like having a pony. You could get around on a cheap item. No one ever thought about riding in them across the country. Right. I mean, that just didn't happen. And now there's people that ride from one border to the next, and so forth, north and south, east and west, and whatever. But they have. But for those two young guys to do it with, you know, like a backpack and right. nothing mm -hmm. else, it's it's just amazing. Yeah, really. it was really amazing. Um, I'm going to add on to something you just said. So I got an email uh, a couple weeks ago from someone in Colorado Springs. Uh, the Colorado Springs Gazette had done a full half-page feature on this book. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Um, so a man read it. Read that. Huh? Maybe Oprah will read that. <laughs> no, she hasn't contacted me. Um, so, uh, this man had seen the article, bought the book, read the book, and uh, got my email off the website, I believe. Anyway, he um, wrote me and he said, I, I just finished reading this book and I was heartbroken. And I'm like, oh, gee, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, I rode a bicycle from Colorado Springs to the East Coast in 1968. And until I read your book, I thought I was the first person to <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, I just had to say that based on what you just said. Well, that's just like when the automobiles started becoming popular. Henry Ford was the one that got that going. Because you could get a, a Model A Ford or a Model T Ford or whatever for a reasonable amount of money, and they were very, very reliable. And so then all the other manufacturers started trying to either make them lux more luxurious or more dependable or whatever, but there was hardly anything that ever met the same quality or the same impact on the society in America as the Ford vehicles, the original ones. And then he kind of instituted the 40-hour work week as opposed to an eight-hour day, you know, and stuff like that. Right. Which is good. 
Yeah. Yeah. Henry Ford did a lot of. Okay. Well, I was just going to say I have a copy of the article from the Gazette. Oh, oh. So oh that's at the cool. end, if anybody would like to. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just pass it around while we're talking? Oh, sure. Yeah, I think we should try to go on e-bots. Yeah. 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 You ever get an e-bike, you will never get on nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, that, that is, uh, you know, since I kind of showed you on history there, but when they went up to Canada and they got the Canadian take on the war and mm -hmm. on, the, on our president at the time and stuff like that, I thought that was, that was interesting yeah. too, yeah. that he was uh, probably not one that went down in history very well the strongest president, mm -hmm. just tr trying to keep us out of the war, but... He, he <laughs> could have done a lot, but he got blocked by Congress. I mean, uh -huh. Wilson wanted to do a League of Nations uh, at the conclusion of World War I, so something like that never happened again. But, you know, it's, it's not part of this book, I don't want to get into it, but he, he really had to compromise so much with so many other people that basically the end of World War I was the cause of World War II. So, and it's still a struggle today in the mm -hmm. Middle East because those boundaries were set back at that time. So anyway, it's neither here nor there. Do you have another book in the works? Um, yeah, I'm working on one now. Mm -hmm. I'm not is, it say is, what it is it historical? It's historical, yeah. Mm -hmm. But in a way, <laughs> It'll be historical, but fiction as well, right? Historical fiction. Um, yeah. Way back, like Marshall Benjamin all started. Way first. back. Way no one's going to be able to tell if I screwed it up or not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <That's> not <laughs> well, Jenny says she can tell me if I screwed it up. Or not. <laughs> I didn't ask you if it's going to be like colors of the earth, but I can't ask you that. So I'm scratching that question. <laughs> but I did want to say about the book, it was such a wonderful book. And it was such a wonderful story to read for us all. Because it reminded us of so many things, not only journeying and growing up, but so many things that are important tied to our history. Mm -hmm. And it was such a uh, fresh drink of cold water. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? In a time like we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was I, I just I kept coming across things that made me think of something else, like when they had that um, butterfly migration thing. Mm -hmm. that on the day of my dad's uh, funeral, we were we were walking back home from the high school. They had his uh, service at the high school, and in La Vida that day, there was a monarch butterfly migration. So those butterflies were migrating up to Canada or whatever they do. And it was crazy to me. It was like I didn't even know. What it was, it was like a miracle at that day. I mean, thinking of that, I was thinking of my dad. But, but then, since then, I've read a few other things about it. But to read that again, I'm like, oh yeah, that reminded me of that day. And the little boy playing the drum yeah. on Independence yeah. Day. Yeah. I thought that was really a touching that, yeah. thing too. And just so many lessons, so many mm -hmm. pieces of the book were really was there a metaphor in that and beautiful. Yeah, the whole park scene was a metaphor. The Tell lady in lavender, the boy, the yeah. drummer boy, it was a whole metaphor. <coughs> mm. It's not elaborate. 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 Tell us what. Okay. <laughs> so, the Statue of Liberty is um, the clarion call to mankind. Liberty, freedom, equality. And so the drummer boy was playing that one riff over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, freedom, liberty, equality. But you can't make that work just by proclaiming it. You need government, you need people working together. You need the music to make it work. So, the lady in Lavender, I chose Lavender because if you take the American flag, which is red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. you merge red and blue together, you get purple, you add white, you get lavender. Mm -hmm. You know, and you look at the red and blue battle lines drawn today between people, mm -hmm. it's not music. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so 
the Lady in Lavender plays a piano. Uh, the piano has 88 keys. The Constitution was ratified in 1788. Oh, Jesus. So the piano is cumbersome. It never belongs in a park. You have to pick it up and carry it. You have to tune it. Um, so government and laws, and that's what makes the clarion call work. You can't have freedom and equality without people working together to make it real. That's great. That's that's good. Good. That's good. So that's what I do in my free time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'll have to rewrite the book. I know, I was just thinking the same thing. I need to rewrite it. I know, well, you can you definitely do that. You didn't, this is a story about freedom, of what you can do. You didn't include all the problems that came after the First World War when government started regulating what people could do. And there was very little of that before the First World War. There was still a land of freedom, and that's what allowed these two boys to do what they did. Right. They didn't have to check in here and do anything or have a license or any of this stuff. It was free. What they decided to do, they could do. They didn't have to ask a mayor or a governor or anybody else. It was a story about freedom. Right, and then... Um, the Statue of Liberty itself, with the, uh, the structure made by Mr. Eichel, um, the serious business of horizontals, verticals, and diagonals, and all the rivets that hold it together. You know, you can't have the Statue of Liberty without that to hold it up. And that's the laws and the, the works of man for equality and liberty. And there's another example of workmanship that was done without equipment. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was all done by hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I do want to comment that the uh, migration of monarchs, I was sitting in my house one day and a monarch butterfly flew by. Mm -hmm. oh. Then a couple more flew by. Yeah. And then a couple more flew by. Yeah. And I sat out there for like two hours and monarchs just kept coming yeah. down the hill and yeah. just kept going. I'm like, I'm going to put this in a story sometime. <laughs> Yeah, that was the most wondrous event that day. Yeah, yeah. and you, wouldn't, you couldn't understand it unless you'd experienced it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I remember that because you couldn't see my flower bed. Everything was covered in monarch butterflies. You could see the shape of the tall plants and the low plants and whatever, but you couldn't see the plants. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. I saw that in Atlanta many mm -hmm. years ago. Our office was that when we were in the new office. The new office, we were 25 floors up. This is downtown Atlanta. And I happened to stand at my big old window at my, in my office and look out, and there they were, just streaming oh, through, wow. streaming through the city of Atlanta. And it was incredible. I Well, I enjoyed reading this book much better than getting on my own stationary bicycle. <laughs> I, I, uh, the other day I think, all right, well, I've, <laughs> I've done my hundred for today. <laughs> so That's a lot. Well, I've had I've had some bicyclist challenge of a hundred miles a day. Oh really? But you know, I said they didn't have reliable odometers. You know, I assume yeah. Lester had a cyclometer yeah. which rolled off his tire or his chain, one of the two, I don't know which. Um, okay. How accurate was that with the tire size? I don't know. Yeah. They had to do section lines, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. And so who knows what they actually did, yeah. but yeah. they were adamant in every article that they wrote 100 miles of every day of travel. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. this is their story. Yeah. Well, if you take the total miles and divide it by the total days, it's fairly close to 100 miles a day is what it is. For their travel days, yes. Yes. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And of course, nobody knows for sure that they measured the miles exactly, but still, it's within reason yeah. of the distance that they went and the side trips they took. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So I, I'd kind of like to know what was most meaningful to, to any of you. What? What was the, most meaningful? And I think oh, it's got something. The school they went to, it was Colorado City, then. I think it's called Palmerdale. I live three blocks away from that. The deaf and blind school, I live like three or four blocks away from that. Really? So that tells me, and I do a lot of biking, it tells me that they were in that neighborhood at one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what gets me going is, is I see the peak, and it's like, yeah, I get on a bike. So I can imagine what they were seeing back then when it was cleaner and cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, since you mentioned that, um, you know, I drove by both Lester's home and Joe's home, and Dryhurst and Son is right across the street from... Uh, Joe's house. Of okay. course, now it's a recycle Oh, okay. Place. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but those buildings, the, both homes still stand. Mm -hmm. So um, I sent a book to each of those homes. Oh. And I said, oh, okay. um, Joe used to live in your home. Lester used to live in your home. Oh. So I never heard anything back from the people who presently live in Joe's oh. home. So is my house. Is it? No. Because your name is Joe, of course. <laughs> Um, but I did hear back from the people who live in Lester's house, and um, she's a teacher at Palmer High School, and I guess her husband is a teacher, I'm not sure where, and they have a fourth grade son who's interested in obscure historical picture uh, people. So she's like, thank you for the book, we're going to enjoy reading this. So, Whenever I'm in Colorado Springs, I'm invited over to see Lester's house. Oh, oh great. That's great. Yeah. Because I kind of imagine, because they have a kitchen scene where they're in the kitchen trying to ambush his dad. Yeah. Exactly. And I just imagine yeah. the kitchen. So I'd be really curious to know yeah. what I imagine. Yeah. Think. You can only tell so much looking through people's windows at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has something in particular that touched them? Well, back then, now you go to gas stations and fill up your tires. It's like, how did they do theirs? They had to have had gear and, and tools to do yeah. such a thing because when you put that many miles on anything, especially mechanical, you're going to have an issue. Because yeah. I ride a lot and I'm always having issues with bike. What I, we, had hand, we had hand, hand tire pumps. And we used those to pump up all the tires, cars, tractors, and bicycles, and I still have one. So they had to have had their own pump. Well, they had to, they packed them with them, because, or else they found someone to loan them one, but it's a little hand pump. It's only about this high. Didn't and it takes a long time to pump up a tire, but still, it does what they needed. There was no air compressors or none of that stuff when they were riding. And what I, what I have them do in the story is, and I, I, I wasn't very much mention of it, but they um, mailed ahead tires and chains yeah. at yeah. certain oh. points and on their they trip. They probably would have had to do something like that. Well, yeah. I think you alluded to that somewhere. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, but to get to a city like, a huge city like Detroit, and to find your aunt's house someplace in Detroit, or the YMCA in Denver, or whatever, you know how it is nowadays, you know, people can't even read a map. <laughs> if you don't have your GPS, you don't even know how to get to any place. But they didn't have anything like that. They just had a paper map on them. You know, they didn't have any Well, and they, could, like they that. could converse with the people that they, in the communities or the areas where they went through, <clears throat> and ask, <clears throat> which way to go? How far is it? What's it like? And they obviously had to do that some. To get to, to get to, to figure out where the hell they were going to go. Yeah, and cities were not as populated and crowded and all that kind of stuff as they are. It would be a hard thing the, to do today. To get in New York City. They're in New York yeah, City with their bikes. Yeah, they think all the you know what I mean? expressways so, and the... Even a hundred years, have years ago, you know. But you know, to that point, um, I started teaching in Whitefield District, which is Whitefield, a city south of Colorado Springs, and it's a subdivision. And it's a bedroom community of Fort Carson. 
but a lot of my students in 1984 had never been to Colorado Springs. So a lot of people in that book, and they had some experiences like this in the story, when they stopped to ask questions, the people didn't know what was around them because they hadn't been there. And this was 1984 when we had cars. But think about this in 1960. I mean, some people couldn't have been 20 miles away from their house if it was quite rural. Yeah. Anybody else have any, um, anything they'd like to say? Oh, I, I've got a, one more thing I want to say. The, the description of the, you know, of the, of the bad stuff, like the tenements and stuff like that, but when they went up, with, well, like in Denver, and then even where their aunt lived with all the kids and all the, the building that was hot, and you could almost smell the cabbage cooking in the ceiling and the, you know, people that haven't taken a shower lately. And just, it's really real about it. The feeling of the different, you know, the different experiences like that. Did like you that. go there? I mean, did you? Where did you draw that from? I mean, that, that I see, that scene was just so, you know, with the open doors and all the noise. The babies are crying. Yeah, yeah. I know. I just figured that's probably the way it was. Uh -huh. I mean, in some places. You just open your doors and oh, to God for a breeze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To bring the hellish heat from one place to the hellish heat. <laughs> <other. laughs> yeah. And they were there in the summer, you know, so mm -hmm. you can just imagine how mm -hmm. humid and hot and all of that stuff mm -hmm. it was. I think an important theme is how the destination is not the main factor, it's the journey that matters so much, and that's true of life in general. Mm -hmm. Did he say that? I think he said that someplace, right? Something like that. Well, the the professor highlighted it, and I think, yeah, Joe says it at the end that they're still just the same people they were. Um, I don't know that I can remember it that clearly. Mm -hmm. Best dance I ever danced. <laughs> Best dance I ever danced. Wow. Um, what did what were you thinking about when Lester said, we don't have to go on. We don't have to go. We don't have to finish this. We can just go back home now. Yeah. Well, what point was that at? Let's see. Yes. I'm trying to think. Towards the end. Yeah, it's towards the end. Is it when they're facing the mud? I mean, it's mud that they... Let's see if I can find that. But I mean, I think it's... Is it Lester? But I think he asked Joe. Don't the Lester one is that we, we, we don't, don't have to. We don't really have And then Joe said, no, we're going to finish this now. So he is the one that got it changed, you know. Was that after I think that they thought, you know, that they, they experienced so much already. And, you know, that maybe it wasn't so important to experience. Yeah, I, I remember that part, but I don't remember where it was. Um, Niagara Falls was kind of cool, too. So I felt that when I saw Niagara Falls for the first time, too. Just at, how amazing, but like you said, one little drop of water and another little drop of water get together, and then it makes a huge, it, it, it's true, you know, it just, I just, I love that image of Niagara Falls. It was on the cover. I'm sorry? Who designed the cover? I it's did. It's really so appropriate. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Who? I, I did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell us what titles you considered. 4,284. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only one you ever considered. Well, yeah. Huh. Um, something that probably makes me really weird and or different for writing. A lot of authors um, like really outline everything. I mean, I had a timeline to go by there where I had to fit in certain things at certain points. But I have no idea what I'm going to write when I finish a chapter. Mm. I mean, no idea, just blank. Wow. And um, You mean what the next one's going to be? Yeah, I have no idea. So. I just wait for something to occur to me, and 
just take off from there. I finish that chapter, I have no idea what I'm going to write. Do you do your thinking like at night? Like when you're that, or just it can just something, come to you? Something will just come to me. Are you a pretty disciplined writer? Do you write every day? Um, I'm the kind of writer where um, I try to do it first thing in the morning while my mind is fresh. But if I have an idea at one in the morning, I've learned that I will not go back to sleep until I get up and write it. <laughs> so I might spend a couple hours, but there's no way I'm going to go back to sleep unless I've gotten it out. So whenever I can. If I have five minutes, I'll take out the laptop. Do you stop writing in between books, or do you write every day regardless? Um, well, usually there's months of editing after you finish one. Mm -hmm. So after a few months of that, then I'll start um, coming up with a new idea. But I also don't know the ending. I don't know where, I, where a story's going to go until I'm halfway through. And then I'm like, oh. This is the end. And I'll usually write the last sentence, and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm working toward from this point on. So it's a weird process. Not including the current one that you don't want to share. How, how many books have you written now? Well, there's three in this series. Jenny, I see you have one in your hand. Are you returning it? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. Um, and I, had, I got the other one, I got the second one in this series of three. This is a young adult series that Roger wrote. I loved this first book. It's called The Hands of Enemies. And then I got the second one from the library, and now I'm going to get the third one. But I'm also going to buy it for my grandson. It's, I, had, I had his dad read it last week. Of, and his dad loved it too. I said, I want you to read this and see if you think that, because my grandson's only 13. But this is another great series. I loved these characters, and I loved the whole thing. Yeah, but how Roger can get into the characters is yeah, really Roger. amazing. And you can see the scenes. But Roger, um, do your, uh, does your story ever come to you in dreams? Do you ever dream your story, or no? If I wrote down my dreams, this would be so weird. <laughs> this is a weird book. <laughs> it's okay. I just want to. It, it didn't mean, you know, I'd be in one of those white jackets with the bumpers. So we, we're not going to go there. We're not going there. Okay. That, that could be a whole different series. Right. So Roger, can you tell us? Can I offer you kudos on some of your wordplay? And I appreciated that throughout the whole book. But there's one place here that just caught my eye and, and my funny bone. So this is on page 216, and they're, I think they're out by Lake Ontario, and the mosquitoes are getting really bad, and maybe that's when they said, oh, let's just go home, you know, or whatever. Um, but this is a made-up word, and I have to attribute that to the author, I assume. It's not in the dictionary. Um, so, um, <laughs> I may need to act up on this one, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's great. I love this, this kind of wordplay stuff. It's so funny. So it says, in addition, they were covered with red welts from, wait for it, Satan's hench skeetos. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just love that. That's a hench dash skeetos. <laughs> that I don't think you'd find anywhere else. So. No, no, I didn't make that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, how much fun yeah, this would be. It has to be a lot of fun. There, you know, there was a lot of humor in the book, too, which was yeah, yeah, it really it was. made it more fun to read. Like, when he got attacked by the June bug before he met June bug, but, you know, the actual June yes. bugs thing, that was pretty yeah. cool. I don't think I know June bugs. Do I? I don't know. Right. Right. grew up in Texas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know June bugs. <laughs> I don't want to or anything like that. When, when we were kids, we would go to Minnesota for the summer, and June bugs, well, what we call June bugs were probably beetles. They were like this long. Oh, gosh. And they'd fly through the night, and they would just horrible noise. It sounded like a motorcycle coming. Oh, and, and, you know, we're little sissy city kids. And we would like scream and run. And, so that screaming and running was Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was totally us. And then these old farmer women would just pick it up, squish it in their hair, yeah. yeah. to kill it. And yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> that lands on you. They have kind of their sticky feet. They have kind of right. sticky but scratchy feet mm -hmm. and legs. Yeah. So I I got a kick out of it, landing on his head and getting tangled in his hair. <laughs> yeah. And I could just think, oh my gosh, that would be horrible. I would be running around. <laughs> they're not even that big in Texas. They're just about yeah. Once we had yeah, and actually it's June, but it's only a reddish brown, but not that big. But they, well, I don't want them in the big town. You turn on the yeah. outdoor mm -hmm. lights at night. Yeah. They're banging against the street door. Yeah. Our dog one time. Got one on her tongue, and her eyes were like this. <laughs> 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 horrible. Are they like palmetto bugs in Florida? You know what a palmetto bug is? Oh, that's a roach. It's like a yeah. cockroach, yeah. but it's about that thing. That's a big roach. As an actual June bug, I probably have never seen. They're supposed to be only an inch long. Yeah, they're like this big. Yeah. I have humpback and reddish brown. Yeah. They'll hurt you. But I figured I needed to put that in for my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, however you wove it all together, I mean, you really gave these two young men such a journey. It was just, I mean, it was hard to believe you weren't following their travel log <coughs> and, and the characters that they met. I mean, and I love that you're saying each morning you, or you get to that next chapter, and you don't know who's going to show up or <laughs> where they're going to be or what all. But you know you're going to like it. Yeah. yeah. I can tell that. Yeah. It's a, it was quite That's a why I asked the question about historical um, records of where they went or so forth. And mm -hmm. you just came up with each one of the steps that they took with yeah. what little reference you had. Mm -hmm. Right. And with COVID, you know, I had originally thought I would travel at least partway through Nebraska, so I could get an idea of their route. Mm -hmm. But then COVID hit, and you couldn't go anywhere because you couldn't get food, you couldn't use a restroom. Um, so I'm like, well, I'm working on this story. I don't, we'll just, we'll make it up. And that's why most cities don't have names. Um, you know, oh, yeah. uh -huh. Omaha, Detroit have names, oh, Juniper yeah. has a name. But most of them don't because I can't, I can't yeah. verify anything, so I'm just going to make it up. Well, you did, you did good, really good. It was a real yeah. pleasure to read. And what you made up is quite relative, it seems to me like, where they are on each stage to the trip. Uh, With the history of what was going on at that time. Right. And, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you're thinking about Michigan or Nebraska or New York, and what you came up with is pretty indicative of what that really is. You didn't mix it up. Thank, thank God for you must have woke, awakened. You must have awakened several mornings. <laughs> well, I think you know one thing we can all agree on: that this was a good choice. Yeah. 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 Really yeah. Yeah. That Roger did a great job, and we can hardly wait. For your next book, mm -hmm. we'll make you do it again now if you if you get it done. <laughs> but, um, but really, I encourage you guys to read his other books as well, and really do get on Amazon and write a review because you never can tell what might catch somebody's eye or something like that. Because this is a book that should go further than it has. It really should go further. It's like it could be a movie. It could be anything. Yeah. So, but um, anyway, I'm. Just really pleased that to have Roger here with us today. And yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. I do want to tell um, the story of Mitzi here because she's been so good to read everything. Um, and sometimes she's kind of like a guinea pig. But um, Tony had been uh, one of the people to critique the first part of the story. You know, the original version. And so when I got it finished, I asked Tony if he would want one for the library. He said, yeah, they would buy one. So when they got it in, I told Mitzi I would like to do some type of program about the book, but you know, she's the program person, so would she read it? So she saw me at church, and she said, I'm only three chapters in, but I told Tony we're going to use this book. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you next week. Yeah. Well, thank you, and really, we we'll look forward to keep writing. Okay. Keep writing. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having everybody.